Happy Equinox, one and all. I'm Kate Byrne, president of Intentional and SOCAP Global. And wow, do we have a conversation that you are about to really enjoy. Uh, this is the second in a five-part series that we're doing around impact and the reimagination of an impact revolution. And this was inspired by Sarani Cohen, who uh, really in a lot of ways needs no introduction, but is, is extraordinary. He's the chairman of uh, Portland Trust and Bridges and an author of a new book, Impact, Impact Revolution. We are joined by Jackie Vanderbrug, who is the managing director and head of sustainable and impact investment strategy at Bank of America. Meg Starr is joining us, who is the global head of impact from Carlisle. And then we've got <clears throat> Jacques Philippe Pavillier. He said, I needed to use my fingers. I'm not sure it came out right, but he's one of the co-founders of Ozone X. And we are very fortunate to have the very talented and terrific um, Leslie Norton, who will be facilitating the conversation from Barron's. A few housekeeping orders. Uh, we'd love to hear where you're joining us from. We'd love to hear what it is you would like to hear more about and a takeaway that you'd love to have. And then I'm also gonna encourage and invite everyone to start feathering in your questions in either the chat or the Q&A box. What we're gonna do now is Leslie's gonna take the baton and we're gonna lead a great conversation, very in depth. Then we'll open it up after about probably a half hour, 35 minutes or so to um, Q&A and then we'll close. So with that, Leslie, please. Thank you, Kate, for that introduction and for inviting Barron's to be part of this discussion. So everyone knows Sir Ronnie Cohen, financier, godfather of venture capitalism, and then godfather of impact investing. So I'm delighted to be here with him today, as well as with our three other esteemed panelists, all personages in the impact world. We're going is to maximize returns for shareholders. So Friedman made this uh, pronouncement a year after Sirani founded Apex. But while Sirani has been able to move with the times, Milton's dictum is showing signs of age, particularly in a year where we've experienced a pandemic, widespread unrest owing to racial and economic inequality, and all the evidence of global warming. One solution, impact investing. Our panelists today also include um, Jackie Vanderbrug, Meg Starr, Jacques-Philippe Piverger, who will help flesh out the landscape for impact as well as some of the solutions that impact investing offers. So I guess the first question that I'd like to ask to Sir Ronnie, you were 26 years old and had just started your firm a year before Friedman made his great pronouncement. Tell us about your journey to today, how greatly the landscape has changed and why impact and ESG investing are a critical part of this new movement called stakeholder capitalism. Well, that's a wonderful question, Leslie, and it's wonderful to be here with you, uh, with Kate, with Jackie, with Meg, and uh, with Jacques Philippe and uh, all the participants in, uh, in this webinar. I actually have a sense of deja vu uh, with when I started out in, in venture capital. I started out in venture capital and I felt that there was something in the air that was changing. Uh, small, I thought, was going to be beautiful. Uh, in those days, the biggest companies were the places where everybody aspired to work. Uh, and uh, when I uh, was at business school, uh, I was one of the few uh, who believed that uh, this whole venture capital gig uh, was going to amount to anything. How could small companies compete with the giants? And, and then we've seen, of course, that it was the beginning of a huge wave of technology which has changed all our lives, which uh, we call the tech revolution. Well, I feel the same uh, today about impact. I feel we're on the threshold of an impact revolution, which actually has already happened in many ways, as we will chat about during, um, uh, during this discussion um, uh, this evening. Um, it's reflected in entrepreneurs uh, like uh, Jacques uh, Philippe and uh, 
and, and others in, in people like Meg of her generation and my daughter Tamara, who was at college uh, with her, who was also involved in, in the impact field. Uh, it's reflected in what uh, banks and investors are doing, uh, which uh, Jackie is deeply involved in. And I think it's going to be as far reaching a revolution as the tech revolution was. If uh, tech has become the water on which every ship must sail today, I think impact will be a layer of water on top of tech on which every ship has to sail. So we're, we're having a, uh, I think, um, a massive period of transition, which is going to be accelerated by COVID. Okay. I'd like to move on to the panelists. You know, your asset managers, allocators, entrepreneurs navigating a $30 trillion space. Has Friedman's dictum been rejected altogether by your clients? Is there still a nugget of truth there? You know, and how do you, you know, bring those thoughts as you, you know, um, as you operate in the world of impact and create the business that you operate for your for your employers? I'd like to start with Jackie. Great, thanks, Leslie. Um, and I, I think that that aspect of the shift that we're seeing um, to Ronnie's comment is being absolutely accelerated by the pandemic um, in a way that maybe was a little bit surprising to some folks at the, the outset, but it what it's done for our clients is brought together you know, the interconnectivity of the world. The fact that the pandemic doesn't stop at borders, that climate doesn't stop at borders, that inclusion can pass through borders. Um, at, at Bank of America, I sit in the wealth management group. Uh, I work for our chief investment officer. And so our clients, um, to your question, range from that individual who saves her first $20,000 beyond what she's saving and, and says, I'm going to become an investor, wants to walk into a bank branch office and say, I want to invest, but I want to invest with impact. Um, I want to understand the impact of the companies in which I am placing my money all the way up and through institutional investors who are increasingly coming to us and saying, we want to understand um, the asset managers that we're investing with and their diversity, their inclusion, as well as the way in which ESG is incorporated into their investment decisions. I do think to, to Ronnie's point about the, the water of tech, the water of impact, um, the, the question that we ask our clients right now is what is it that you, what do you want the power of your portfolio to be? What's the, the impact that you want in the world, but also for who? And that for who is really important. That's the transition from just shareholders to stakeholders. That impact for employees, impact for customers, impact for communities in which we operate. Thank you very much. So Meg, how is Friedman's dictum or reaction to it shaping the way your clients invest and your companies operate? Thanks, Leslie, and thanks for having us, Kate. Um, so at Carlisle, we operate in the private market context. And so I think the background is helpful here. In private markets, interest rates are low and are gonna stay that way. There is a lot of dry powder chasing a finite number of deals and the entry multiples are getting higher. And so there's this question of how do you continue to drive financial value in a much more competitive market? And so what we've seen is that the conversation has really shifted because instead of saying, how do I drive financial value in spite of focusing on these other dimensions of business, diversity, climate, resilience, et cetera, we're saying, how do we drive value because of focusing on those dimensions? Because what we're seeing is that ESG and impact themes could actually just be a lens for finding alpha in a rapidly changing world, because it allows you to see around corners and down hallways faster than other investors in an increasingly competitive market. And so I think we've just seen that paradigm shift of saying, actually, these are just different dimensions of business excellence, and they're dimensions the market is increasingly pricing in. Um, the energy transition is a great example. Sometimes it can seem like the only story there is renewables. And that's a huge part of the energy transition, a place where we need to keep deploying capital. 
But there's also a need for capital to help companies across the broader spectrum transition their business models. Um, we did some research this winter and we found that if we could take an oil and gas company from 0% revenues from renewables to 40% revenues from renewables over your hold period, you could almost double your trailing EBITDA exit multiple. And so I just, I use that as an example of, of showing how the market is really starting to understand that these different factors, environmental, social governance competencies are actually indicators of management excellence. And so that's actually a critical tool in a private investor's toolkit now as we think about financial value. That sounds wonderful, Meg. Um, Jacques, you look for underrepresented founders and mission-driven companies. What are your thoughts about this discussion? Sure. Thank you, Leslie. And thanks to Kate and SoCap for creating this space. It's a, an amazing group of folks. Um, you know, my view is Milton made his pronouncements 50 years ago, and it was quite relevant for business at the time. Whereas now in 2020, it's actually going to be critical for our humanity to move away from that and being more of a multi, having more of a multi-stakeholder approach is, is key to not only our existence, but we're starting to see great correlation between that type of investing and performance. I think Meg uh, touched upon that and Carlisle and Meg had a, a great report come out on that just recently. And then for us specifically at Ozone X, as you mentioned, we're particularly focused on backing underrepresented founders. So namely women and underrepresented founders. And what we found is that, and, and we do not only focus on that, but we also focus on the extra overlay of sustainability, health and wellness, education, and future of employment. And what we found from initial investments is that the performance of the types of companies we back are significantly, significantly better than those uh, that are just purely market driven. And so for example, when we look at up rounds in 12 to 18 months, which is often looked at in the venture space, you know, among top quartile uh, venture funds, about 20 to 25% of their companies tend to have up rounds within 12 to 18 months. Whereas in this cohort, it was more like 86%. And so we believe that not only is it kind of passe uh, to continue to think of you know, Milton's pronouncements, but it's just not in the best interest of investors. With that being said, you know, if you, if you uh, take a look at Sir Ronnie's forthcoming book, he mentions that uh, among retail investors, something in the order of 70% of individuals want to see impact as part of their investment thesis, but actual institutional investors are still lagging. So there's a lot of room to go from there. I think Carlisle and uh, Jackie at Bank of America are kind of at the vanguard and they're trying to push that curve, but there's still a lot of uh, wood to chop as, as one would say. So we're definitely in the early innings, but I think uh, directionally, we're in a very compelling place. And to Ronnie's point earlier, uh, this is a, a pivotal time. And you know, myself and my co-founders at Ozone X are just excited to be a part of this. Thank you, Jacques Philippe. So, Sir Ronnie, let's move on. Um, we all know you like impact weighted accounts. Um, tell us briefly about them. And also, how can you introduce a new framework when so many people have framework fatigue already? Oh, thank you, Leslie. Please call me Ronnie. Okay. So, so uh, let, let me um, just define impact investment for our listeners so we're all on the same page. So uh, ESG has the intention to create impact, and there's $30 trillion of ESG money uh, flowing today. Uh, it represents about uh, more than a third of professionally managed assets across the whole world. So it's well above tipping point. Impact investment defines itself as having the same intention as ESG, but measuring the impact achieved. And today uh, we are at 700 billion. Uh, we're going to hit a trillion in 2020. Uh, is is where it's heading. Now, if you look at um, uh, social impact bonds, which Bank of America has been actually very uh, supportive of uh, in the United States, pay for success bonds, as, as they call 
you measure the impact in terms of dropout rates from school or absorption of immigrants into the workforce. And when you achieve that, you get paid by the state of Massachusetts for the results you achieved and your investors get their money back with the return. So pay for success is, is very easy to implement today and it is moving forward at a, at a good uh, clip. But if we look at companies, Leslie, uh, and we say, well, 30 trillion of ESG wants to achieve impact what type of transparency do we have on the impact that has been created? The answer is virtually zero, because companies are reporting on the good they do and ignoring the harm they do. And the reporting tends to be partial and qualitative rather than quantitative. And, and so we need transparency. Transparency is a human right. We have the right to know what impact a company is creating on people and planet. And impact weighted accounts, which sounds very technical, are basically taking the financial accounts of a company and adding or subtracting um, to their costs and therefore to their profit, the amount of damage or of social and environmental improvement that they bring. And there's been a, a big effort, which I'm privileged to chair at Harvard Business School, which this year has resulted in a real breakthrough showing the accounts of uh, or the environmental damage caused by 1800 companies across uh, the world. And Leslie, if I say to you that um, more than 250 of the 1800 companies uh, creating more environmental damage than they are making profit in a year. You know, that is, that is major news. A uh, 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 third of these companies are creating damage environmentally that's equivalent to 25% of their profit. And so when we begin, and you can go to the site, it's uh, uh, open source, uh, everyone, Harvard Business School, Impact Weighted Accounts, and you look at the individual companies and you compare them, you see that within the same sector, there's a huge gap between leaders and laggards. Like you find some companies in the chemical industry creating 140% of their sales, not of their profits, of their sales uh, in damage, and others creating 10%. And so the idea behind um, uh, impact weighted accounts is to provide this transparency on the impact on people and planet that is created through the products of a company, through its operations, and through its employment. Now, you raise a question that uh, obviously is a, is a very important one. Is this the time to heap an additional obligation on companies? Well, it's big crises that lead to big steps forward. And in 1929, when the great crash occurred, investors realized they had been investing in companies without understanding what profit they were exactly making because each company then could pick its own accounting policies and there were no auditors uh, to verify the numbers. And so in 1933, the United States led the world in bringing generally accepted accounting principles, GAAP and auditors. Today, with 30% of professionally managed money, or at least an amount equivalent to 30% of professionally managed uh, money going to achieve impact uh, as well as profit with no transparency, we want governments to mandate, as they did in 1933 for gap accounting, gap accounting, generally accepted impact principles, also audited. And if you think about the cost of preparing these additional accounts, and you relate it to the massive environmental damage you see on the Harvard Business School data set, a single company creating $200 billion um, of damage in a year. 
other companies that have household names in the consumer product area are creating $1.6 billion of profit and $1.8 billion of environmental damage in a year. When you begin to see these numbers and compare different companies within the same sector, the investor money shifts to those that are delivering a better combination of profit and impact. And I'll close with this, Leslie, by simply saying that we can already see the effect of this ESG money flowing through the system. You can already see a correlation between lower valuations on the stock market and higher pollution created by companies. I'd like to, um, I'd like to just repeat that um, Sir Ronnie's article about impact weighted accounts with George Seraphim, it was in the Harvard Business Review this past summer. It's a great read. I just read it again myself this morning. Um, and it's full of, um, it's full of companies. He actually names names. So if you wanted to know what he's talking about in specific detail, you can go there. Okay, so let's turn to our panelists. Um, you know, how I want to ask you how you're guiding your investee companies. You know, have you been urging them to adopt impact weighted accounts? What kinds of reporting are you asking for? And one of the issues that, um, that has been brought up in the past is that, you know, the, the data for KPIs and other measurements of impact was inadequate. <coughs> As, has, has that situation changed? So Jackie, I'll start with you. Yeah, Leslie, we definitely um, appreciate the, the framework fatigue. And I think it, it, it is important to, to note that um, the frameworks um, were, were a really essential part of this transition, right? The frameworks have evolved because they had different user communities. Um, some of them have been led more by investors, others by corporates, others by NGOs. And so in that way, it, it is a useful place. And we're at a point where some level of consolidation and comparability is really important. Um, we have been involved in, and our CEO, Brian Moynihan, has led some work um, with the World Economic Forum and the International Business Council around a framework, in this case, um, the 120 members of the International Business Council. So this is a a corporate led initiative with the four largest accounting firms. So really trying to say, how do we pull from the various different frameworks, which all had uh, really useful purposes, but to a framework that is industry agnostic um, and much more related to, as Sarani said, people, planet, prosperities and principles of governance and that principles of governance being a key part of how investors look at, at companies. So, you know, in my mind, we are absolutely pushing for more transparency. Um, I think part of it will come from, from corporations and it'll be because they're being asked for transparency by all of their stakeholders. Um, probably the most uh, urgent there is, as Sir, Sir Ronnie said, the investor stakeholders who are clearly um, that the cost of capital is now being related to transparency in a way that it absolutely was not before. We've seen this in terms of you know stock price and, and the way bonds are pricing in the market and so forth. So that's really quite interesting. Um, the other piece is that not all transparency comes from corporations, right? So you are seeing a lot in the way of big data where investors are pulling government data, NGO data, media data together, and that unstructured data is creating really interesting insights. I think it comes back to some of what Meg said, which is the biggest fallacy in this space is that this additional insight, whether it be impact insight, ESG insight, is a constraining um, factor in investments, when in reality, it is additional. It allows an investor to be smarter um, in this time where we haven't seen this change, this this amount of uh, change at this level in you know centuries. So we're we're at the point where all of this new information, whether it be impact weighted accounts, which I'm I'm really eager to see where they go with that because it's really important data, um, or the data that is more just transparently provided initially by companies 
through something like the IBC framework is supportive to investors. Thank you. What do you think, um, Meg, of, of, um, of what Jackie just said? Yeah, I really agree that these frameworks were such a necessary part of pushing forward this field and that we're reaching this critical point of how do we start consolidating and using these frameworks in a way that is useful for investors. And so I think one of the things I think about a lot as a private investor is what role do we have to play in this? Because we have a critical mass of portfolio companies and portfolio companies that we can get very granular data from in a way that you can't always in public markets because you have to rely on the company to self-disclose it. And so I think private investors were just in the early innings of this have a really important role to play in kind of sorting through these frameworks, deciding which ones will be really useful and then helping portfolio companies use them. I think we've really seen that data help our financial outcomes in two main ways, kind of the macro versus micro argument. And I think in the ESG field, sometimes there can be this division of which one's more important. And I think in a lot of ways you need both. On the micro level, bespoke material ESG data really helps us drive efficiencies in business models, open up new demand channels. Um, one example, we have a portfolio company called Genealogia. Um, they're based in Spain and they finish denim for the garment industry, which is a huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions globally. Genealogy has a technology that uses about 85% less water and fewer chemicals to finish denim. They make about 15% of the world's 6 billion pairs of genes that come out every year. The neat thing is tracking that KPI helps with the cost basis. It's a more efficient business model, less output, less waste. Increasingly helps new demand channels because as consumers value these traits, being able to quantify that can really help on the revenue side. But importantly, this past year, for the first time, we were able to get debt for Genealogia that was linked to hitting that water reduction target. And so in the same way that we saw it for pay for success bonds in the early days, we're now seeing more broad based companies be incentivized on these change dimensions through capital markets. So I'd say we really see it on the micro side as being quite helpful for specific companies. And on the macro side, we need to know what we own and we need to understand where there are correlations with business performance, what our exposures are, what our risks are, what our opportunities are. Um, Jacques Philippe talked about a paper that we put out this winter where you know, we have really great financial data on our portfolio companies. If we can start pairing that with really granular ESG data, it's kind of our researcher's dream. Um, and so we found in our portfolio that of our companies that had at least two diverse board directors, we have about 12% faster annualized earnings growth than our portfolio companies without diverse directors. And each additional diverse director is correlated with a 5% increase in that number. And so that's just a great example of we can read all the academic research we want, we can talk to our deal teams, but if the proof is in the pudding of our actual investment portfolio, there are a few things more than that. Um, so I, I guess in summary, on the ESG data side and the impact data side, I think private investors can really help push this forward by thinking about how we look across our portfolio and really orienting towards how do we get information that's not collecting data just for data's sake, but collecting data that can help drive better investment decisions. Well, that's, that sounds thrilling, Meg. I wanted to ask Jacques Philippe about, um, you know, the role that VCs play and how you're guiding um, the, the companies that you're, uh, but the investors and, and companies there that you're, um, that you're working with. Sure, happy to uh, shed a little color there. And, you know, for context, I've sat on both sides of the table. So I started my career at AIG Investments and we had a little over 500 billion with 380 on the public side and 120 billion in private investments. And it's interesting when you sit on that side versus the smaller kind of venture fund and how you operate and how you manage some of these. So, you know, when you think of the impact weighted accounts, I think it's an amazing concept. Uh, Ronnie, for what, for what it's worth, I've already started talking about it in other, in other groups and people are excited about it. Uh, but it's definitely more challenging for small firms as, as well as small venture, right? So for example, when Ronnie started APAX with 10 million pounds, it would be difficult for him to allocate resources to figuring out the impact weighted accounts. But as they grow, then you can do more. And that's part of how we see it. And then furthermore, when I think of companies in our portfolio, there's 
there are certain types of measurement that are easier, right? So we back women and underrepresented founders. So we can clearly say, you know, we have this many uh, female founders, we have this many black and Latino. And so those are kind of easy. And then we have certain others that are moderately easy. So for example, one of the companies we really like is called Linear Labs. Uh, they make smart engines for electric vehicles, uh, three to four times the power with the same size uh, and usable for uh, everything from scooter to car to plane, heating, ventilation, fast growing and amazing. And so that's an example where every, every vehicle or every company that uses an engine, we can you know, correlate a certain uh, displacement of CO2 and keep track of that relatively easy. But then when you get a little bit more granular, it takes a lot more resources. For us, part of how we see that is an iterative process. Um, you know, with our model, we're using collective expert intelligence and tech to be more thoughtful with respect to how we source, how we diligence and ultimately lead uh, to better outcomes. And our hope is that we're able to scale in such a way that performance and size don't conflict. Because typically with venture, it's hard to scale because it's so tied uh, to you know, two or three partners, their expertise and geographic reach. We're leveraging the full weight of our network and communities in order to drive you know, better results. And so in as far as five to 10, yeah, 10 years out, <clears throat> instead of managing 150 million or even 500 million, you're adding a zero or two, then you're able to really use uh, scale in order to you know, do more measurement of impact, be more supportive of the portfolio companies in that regard. And that's actually super exciting to us. And that's part of the reason that myself and my partners decided to you know, start something from the ground floor and make sure the foundation is sound so that we could bring resources to bear that you know, can truly uh, handle the scale of challenges that we have before us. Thank you. Um, I wanna jump in. There's a couple of questions that I would love you all to um, take a think on and, and give some response to. One has to do with impact investment and its performance right now during these lovely COVID times. Another has to do with actually the process of impact investing. And then the other is more specific to a certain um, target group. So I'm gonna start with the first one, which is you know, impact investments are outperforming uh, traditional bets in these coronavirus times. Is this explained by the shock of and the impact done to uh, energy and financial industries or is it simply organic or is it simply we now have about 10 to 15 years worth of data that's starting to collect and people are getting more comfortable with it? Ronnie, I'd love to get have you jump in and then uh, everyone else take a, take a follow up after that. You're on mute, Ronnie. Give me. It's a combination of all the, the factors that you've just referred to. But if you take Tesla as an example, uh, and I know it's had a volatile uh, stock price, but here is a company whose purpose was not simply to make money, but to shift the automobile industry away from the combustion engine and the pollution it brings. And it's achieved that. And in the process of achieving that, it's built up a valuation that's bigger than the valuation of General Motors, okay? So I think the new investment normal is risk return impact. We shifted from centuries of just looking at return. In the middle of the last century, we shifted to measuring risk and the concept of measuring risk which started at the same university uh, that uh, Milton Friedman was at, the University of, of, of Chicago, brought really fundamental change to portfolios all over, all over the world. Why? Because it brought the concept of risk-adjusted returns, it brought the concept of diversification, and then you could include areas like the ones where I made my, my own career um, venture capital and private equity, uh, which funded the tech uh, revolution, venture capital, uh, in good part, and 
funded globalization because investment in emerging markets, if you didn't have a concept of diversification, wouldn't have happened. I mean, it seems odd, but when I kicked off my career, the average pension fund only held the stocks of its national stock market and the bonds of its national government. Okay, so diversification changed everything. And I think impact now that we're beginning to measure it is going to take us to risk, return and impact. So it's a new normal. Investors are realizing that they're looking for these types of companies. The amount of money that they are driving towards them is growing geometrically uh, year, year in, year out. But there's a fundamental change in the same way that there was a fundamental change coming back to your original question uh, this evening, um, uh, at least for me, uh, Leslie, um, uh, when venture capital came in, the fundamental change is we're beginning to realize that risk return impact delivers better returns than just risk return. And I want to give a quick example of why bringing impact in can boost your returns very significantly. I want to take the example of a very ambitious venture here in, in, in Israel from which I, I, I speak uh, this evening from Tel Aviv, a company called Orcam. The founders of Orcam sold their startup out to Intel for $15 billion. It was in the driverless car area. The aunt of one of the founders was going blind. She asked him to help. Six years ago, he created a company to help the blind. It's called Orcam. It's a pair of spectacles. And on the side hangs uh, something that looks like a memory stick, which whispers into the ear of the wearer, the page of the book they're holding, the banknote in their hand, the, you know, the envelope um, that's just come in um, uh, from the mailman. Now, you'd say that's an unbelievable impact venture. Uh, because it's helping 35 million blind people, 250 million visually impaired people. But if you think with an impact, uh, or if you look at an opportunity like this um, with an impact lens, you ask yourself the question, how can this technology help the greatest number of people in the world? And you get a very surprising answer, Kate. Uh, the answer is, what if you gave these spectacles to the 800 million illiterate adults in the world? What would that do for their lives uh, and for their livelihoods and for their economies and for the world economy to bring 800 million people from not reading to reading? So you create new business um, opportunities uh, for underserved markets uh, technology can be a huge uh, vehicle for achieving that. And then on the other side, you reduce the risk of talent walking away from you, consumers and investors doing the same, uh, you're being regulated and taxed and all the rest of it. So underlying this shift to a new in, in investment normal is the fact that it's likely to be, it's already proving to be more profitable. Kate, I'd jump in and just say, you know, yeah. to your your question, um, the and and where Ronnie left off in in more profitable. What we did see um, is our our clients have told us over the years they were really interested in impact investing, but they had a concern about performance. Right? They weren't interested in ethically losing money. Yep. And so, um, what we had seen is over the years that funds that were incorporating ESG data that we're thinking from a sustainability lens in terms of solving the world's largest problems were performing quite well, but there was a concern that that was just a bull market phenomenon, right? right. Now what we had in the first quarter of this year was a dramatic, albeit short test of what happens to sustainable investors in bear markets. And in the public markets, what we saw was that, you know, from that peak, um, in February down through the trough that the sustainable funds did perform uh, or, or top uh, quartile anyways better than the market uh, by about 5%. Hmm. Now, the interesting thing is then you say, oh, but that's just energy, right? That's just an overweight to tech. 
it's actually, it holds up if you control for size, which gets to some of what was mentioned about the concern about smaller companies not being able to re um, report. It holds up if you control for sector. Um, you still saw that outperformance or protection, that risk mitigation this year. So I think that you know, we are then also seeing that sustainable funds are keeping pace in the recovery. Um, mm -hmm. Again, these are public market numbers, but I think Meg gave a, a lot of great examples from the private market that also talked to this aspect of how is it that additional information, um, you know, that it broadens and and the analogy that i use all the time is it's like what what happened to doctors when they got the x-ray before a doctor had the x-ray right they they listened to your heart they looked at your skin they looked in your eyes um when they got the x-ray they did all of that and more so sustainable investors don't stop doing all of the traditional financial analysis, that's the fallacy that's out there. It's just they have more insights. It's a both yeah. and. Interesting point. Jacques, did you want to jump in and Meg? Sure. Um, what I would add here is that, um, you know, on my end from 2012 to 15, I actually built and ran a solar product company and went from concept to distribution more than 70 countries. And it was structured as a benefit corporation. And <laughs> much of what Ronnie described, we benefited from, right? So more investors are interested because they feel good about it. You get free press because it makes the writers look good. You get free consulting. You get all these other benefits that you wouldn't otherwise get if it was just pure profit, even though it is a for-profit company. And so I think that's right on. You would think that having had that experience, I'd be fully clear, but I even found myself in this conflict when we were setting up our fund in that in my view, there's a massive need for more capital among women and underrepresented founders, right? So they represent more than 60% of the population and get less than 6% of the capital. And I think if people have greater wealth and capital, that's a massive impact. So why should we do anything more than that as long as they're building great businesses? Instead, we ended up netting out with adding the additional layer that they need to be solving for something of consequence. Right, I thought that was excessive, but that was before quarantine and COVID. Then we go into this downturn and the companies that we love like Linear, well, they do really well in down markets because they tend to be solving for things that are important, right? People are still gonna need energy and hopefully it's clean irrespective of the market. They still need their good health. They still need education. Whereas when it's pure play business and it's just bottom line driven, they often do not consider all the other ramifications and they create a lot of friction. So, you know, for the layman, it's kind of like trying to go from here to there, but encountering a lot of friction because you're myopic and only focus on one element of the journey. Whereas when I think of the sustainable investor, they're taking as many stakeholders into account as possible all those people feel like they're going on that journey with you. It's a collective participatory approach. And so you have supporters along the way that make it more fluid and it ends up yielding much better returns irrespective of how you look at it. And now that we've had some cycles over the last 10, 15 years to see how companies are performing, the data is starting to uh, you know, represent that and you know, hopefully continues as such. Yeah, I was, I was smiling at um, Jackie, your analogy about the x-ray machine. I really like that. And I was thinking about how um, I'd been talking to a reporter a couple of years ago and we were talking about ESG integration and we were going back and forth and he just wasn't really getting it. And he said, you know, it just feels to me like you're asking investors to work with one hand to hide behind their back. And I said, no, we're actually, we're giving them a third hand. So this idea of, and, and so I was thinking about that as you were talking about the x-ray, I don't know if, what about this field makes it so right for metaphor. But I was thinking about that with Ronnie, your idea of risk, return, and impact. And it's about broadening the aperture of how we think about risk and return. Um, we actually saw that this past year. I was planning, we did our first climate scenario planning exercise as a firm this past spring to look across our global portfolio to say, what are the risks coming out? What are the opportunities? How do we build in critical thinking around this? And as part of that, I was talking to, to people at the firm and, and we had a former um, CTO, George Kaiser, who's now an operating executive. 
And actually about uh, three years ago, she had run a disaster planning exercise with our executives. And it was funny because at the time we didn't think to label it climate risk, even though a lot of times extreme weather related events are correlated to that. But as a result of that kind of war room exercise, we realized we needed much better work from home technology. We needed much more efficient ways to communicate with the whole firm. We needed much better resiliency with our data centers, et cetera. And they'd actually made all those changes that enabled us to have almost perfect continuity when COVID hit and we all had to work remotely. And I thought that was such a great analogy to say, this is about future-proofing businesses. Mm -hmm. I gave that example of doing the climate scenario workshop. Another example about adding tools to our toolkit, um, we were diligencing a portfolio of assets this winter that had hard assets on coastal real estate. And so for the first time, we brought in climate risk consultants to help us in diligence. You know, we bring in tax consultants and legal. So we brought in climate risk modelers to help us look at sea level rise, extreme weather related events, insurability, because it wasn't just about better pricing that risk. It was also about thinking through how we could build in resilience over our hold period, because even if we don't experience the negative impacts from climate change during our hold period, as the world gets smarter about this, that could impact our exit multiple. And so how do we start thinking about adding value through that way? Because it's not just about where we're buying a company or asset, it's about where we're exiting it and the kind of world we're exiting into. Yep. Really interesting point. Um, but what can I, I want to- Can ahead. I follow with one point um, on what Meg has just said? Uh, if you look at the private equity industry, which has a long-term perspective and tries to look at the second bounce of the ball, as it were, rather than the one that everybody can see, uh, the top seven leaders of, of uh, the private equity industry have all gone in this direction. Uh, so you have Meg at uh, Carlisle, you have TPG, you have uh, Blackstone, you have KKR, uh, you have partners group in uh, in in uh, Europe. Uh, Apollo uh, are now uh, raising an impact fund. Uh, so the the private uh, equity industry and some of the venture capital industry. There have always been funds like uh, Double Bottom Line Ventures, Nancy Fund, uh, uh, Fund, and others. But I see more evidence now of traditional venture capital firms looking for impact investment. Now, that's already an indicator because these firms are geared to the future to anticipate what's going to happen, as Meg was explaining. But then you're beginning to find it in public market investors. I heard the presentation uh, on, on uh, Zoom a couple of days ago by Bridgewater talking about risk-return impact and that this is the way to perform for the future. So. When you begin to find uh, BlackRock and Bridgewater in the public markets um, doing the same thing, you have to say that, you know, this is more than the olive branch that uh, Christopher Columbus saw uh, <laughs> as he approached uh, the United States of, or, or America as it, uh, as it uh, then, uh, then was. I mean, clearly, this is going to be the future. Which will be terrific. So <clears throat> to that end, I want to address three quick questions and we're getting close on time. I know there's Leslie's got a biggie that she wa we want to um, we want to glean from you as well. So uh, Ryan Kronig was asking, has anyone experienced their impact investing process, the advising, giving or pursuing to be more collaborative and supportive than traditional form of investment, which tend to be to a degree exclusive and elusive? Jacques, you, you touched upon that a bit. In your in your last answer, I think. Sure. <clears throat> um, I think for us, from the ground floor, we've developed a, a process that we think is meant to be collaborative. And you know, I've noticed across the board, uh, people are a bit more friendly and collaborative than they have been historically, just across asset classes, anyway. But I think with our model and approach we literally, instead of limiting our diligence to what myself and my partners know, uh, we expand it to 30 to 50 relevant sector experts who are able to be supportive in the process. And so that helps if you think of the funnel, we've expanded the top of the funnel because our community also helps source more deals. But then furthermore, 
um, in terms of the diligence, we've tightened, tightened the bottom of the funnel because there are certain things that we might have missed, like we might have not thought on our own uh, to bring in the climate uh, researchers that Meg did, but most likely one of the 40 to 50 other people would have, or I may see a company and think it's amazing, but then come to find out there are two others that are a little bit further along. Um, so we've basically built in collaboration into our model. Um, I often joke and call our model the post-ego approach uh, to venture investing. And I think oftentimes, probably in the time of Milton, of Milton um, humility and top performance were considered antonyms. I actually think they're more synonymous, right? So going together, you're actually gonna go further. Uh, you may not go as fast immediately, but it's far more sustainable. And we've kind of built that in to our approach. And the one thing I wanted to mention on Ronnie's comment, and, and actually I mentioned something similar last week on the, on the Nexus chat. Um, I think it is absolutely promising that uh, the top uh, private equity funds, uh, you know, be it Blackstone, Carlisle, everyone else, uh, are starting to move into impact. And I think what is going to be critical is how they go about doing so, right? Because there, there needs to be greater representation of the constituents that are looking to be impacted, right? So obviously what it has been, as I mentioned, you know, a tiny percentage of the people at the top as well as the investees have been anything other than you know, white men. And so if, if you wanna have impact across such a broad spectrum of sectors, as well as you know, whatever it is, there needs to be greater representation. Otherwise, it's likely to be whitewash and not really impactful in the way that it needs to be. And I think certain firms are taking that seriously and, and putting plans together, but it's not something that's gonna happen overnight Right. And we need to be thoughtful with respect to how that's done. Exactly. Um, Shiva Patel is curious about, can you expand upon your perspectives around venture impact and finance in uh, climate and energy space? Where are the pain points and opportunities for younger folks who are trying to break into this impact field, especially BIPOC? Do you, want, do you want me to try to answer? Right. Yep. Yeah. So I think there are impact opportunities. I'd be interested in having Leslie's views about this uh, from, you know, from her position as a journalist who is looking at the wide world and trying to make sense of, of the patterns um, within it. Uh, it seems to me that impact exists in every sector. Uh, so uh, you know, within within um, uh, health today, within education, within energy, uh, uh, you know, almost any sector that you can that you can think of. Um, I guess if you look at the fossil fuel companies and you look at the, you know, thirty nine billion dollar of damage that Exxon Mobil is causing a year, and you look at the eight billion that BP is causing and the thirteen that Shell are causing, you you know you come back to the point we've heard before about some uh, fossil fuel companies uh, actually investing in clean energy and shifting their you know shifting their business model in in the direction of positive environmental impact and it seems to me that within all these sectors and leslie that's why i was thinking about you within all these sectors we see individuals who are saying what we're saying uh, you know in this discussion today is it is it your view uh, leslie that uh, that this is right or do you see it in in a different way Let me just answer, um, just looking at a very, very small part of, um, of the industry, but one which I cover a, a great deal, obviously asset management. And so many of you here who are on the panel, you're right, well, we're all connected to it. But um, what I, I have written about recently is within the allocators, the asset owners, 
um, there's a huge demand for asset owners to or asset managers to take diversity very seriously at the highest levels. Um, we've seen BlackRock vowing to increase the numbers of women and P POCs in their enterprises. And um, Jackie's own company um, announced uh, maybe about a month ago that in its really highly prized chief investment office, that they were gonna put diversity and inclusion at the heart of all their analysis for, um, for every manager they choose to make available to their wealth management clients, which I thought was quite amazing. And when we wrote about that, we had um, really so many um, people writing back saying it's about time and who are very excited about the opportunities that were available to them. And, you know, maybe Jackie, you could talk a little bit about that um, initiative because I think it's a really, really important one and um, one that other people who are sitting in the audience would like to know. Yeah, I'll, I'll just um, say briefly, this was um, work that we had done uh, over a couple of years, um, partially driven by client interests and questions but mostly driven by the firm's commitment. Um, Brian Moynihan, our CEO, chairs our Diversity and Inclusion Council. He chaired that before he was CEO. When he became CEO, he didn't stop chairing it. He hasn't missed a meeting in 10 years. Um, this is a corporate commitment, and it is because we think we are a better firm if we are inclusive. And so we started to say, well, wait a second, if we believe this ourselves and we look at the academic research, um, why is it that we're not using that as part of a lens as to how we evaluate both asset managers and particular fund teams for our platform? So um, we are also well aware that this is something that's going to take years. And so we're involved with a set of initiatives in the industry about you know, how is it that we move um, diverse emerging managers more quickly um, to scale. Okay, thank you, Jackie. So um, I'm mindful of our time. We have just a smidgen more time. I'd like to ask all the panelists, since we started off this discussion talking about Friedman's dictum and how it's changed, how the world has changed 50 years later, what do you all think the world looks like 50 years hence, 50 years from now? You know, how will capitalism have changed then? And so Ronnie, or Ronnie I will ask you that question first. Um. Uh, Leslie, I think we're going to be talking 50 years from now about the interactions between government and business uh, and the respective responsibilities of each to bring solutions um, to social and environmental um, issues. Uh, it may be that uh, by then uh, we will be taxing companies on the profit they make minus the net positive impact they make. You know, uh, it, it, it may it may be uh, that uh, government begins to provide um, investment um, incentives uh, for companies that are going to deliver greater impact as a result. Um, and and I, I think what we're going to achieve over the next um, 50 years uh, really is to bring uh, companies and investors to create solutions that improve lives and the planet. That's great. Um, what do the rest of us think? Um, Meg, what do you think? I think um, I, I predict uh, three potential things happening. I, I'd say the first is I think we're moving out of this binary world of this is an impactful company or this is not an impactful company to recognize that every company has impact. And so we can't bucket things into good and bad and call it a day. We have to be focused on trajectory. Um, so I think my, my second prediction is, is that this field will really evolve into a concept of change over time. And so how do we help all companies across an economic spectrum really build into a sustainable future along dimensions of diversity, of the energy transition, of engaged employees. And so I think instead of this idea of static state business model, we'll really start focusing on how do we think about change and improvement as driving the real impact. And then the, the third thing I would say is that the, the goalposts are always moving. 
Um, and so the great thing about this field is that as we understand things better, they get priced in. So a lot of the basics around energy efficiency, we just know that those are you know, better business models now. And so we do those. And so as we learn more about employee engagement and productivity and diversity and inclusion, those things will become business normal. But that doesn't mean that there won't always be something coming down the pike, which is material in its own way. Um, and so I love that idea of dynamic materiality and that there's always room to improve. And so it's not that we'll be finished one day. We don't reach ESG nirvana. We have to keep going. Um, and the best investors will be the ones that do that faster and further than others. Thank you, Meg. How about you, Jacques? Oh, you know, I could easily just say plus one. Um, my co-panelists have said uh, great things there. Um, I, you know, I agree. I think in the future, there's going to be far more of a focus on sustainability and impact-oriented investing. Um, I think greater collaboration to what we just discussed. I think uh, within the venture space, which is what I'm currently focused on, we're going to see more of the collective expert intelligence and tech being brought in and kind of less eagle-centric type of investing. Um, as it yields uh, better outcomes. Um, and generally speaking, I think the term impact investing is going to go extinct instead of all our animals. <laughs> um, and it's going to be considered an oxymoron. It's investing. And if you're doing it well, then that means you're doing it more thoughtfully and considering multiple stakeholders because you want to have optimal performance over the long run. And so 50 years out, that's, that's what I see in my crystal ball. And uh, yeah, thanks again, everyone, uh, for this wonderful conversation. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. That's great. And Jackie, how about you? Jackie, how about you? You're on mute. Okay. Um, Jackie may be frozen. Oh, no. Yeah, I, I love the enthusiasm and the talk. Oh, I love the, the optimism of my fellow panelists. I'll, I'll live in any of your future scenario, uh, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, I'll, I'll add three quick things. Um, one, I, I do think that the large companies um, are gonna turn over quickly, right? So to what we've said all along, the S&P 500 is gonna look different because you're gonna have those companies that have really focused their purpose on solving challenges grow in a way that is disruptive. Um, and part of that is, you know, if we look 50 years back, Leslie, we saw oil and gas and, and the energy space really dominate and drive and now it's tech. And so you have to think of like, tech enabled everything and how is that changing, but how do you do that? How do you think about that in connection with purpose? And the other piece that I put through this is the next generation and not just you know the millennials, but the centennials, the kids that are zooming right now through their, their way through school and asking questions about what does that create in terms of equity in kids who have tutors and don't have tutors. Um, those questions weren't asked 25 years ago, those kids are the employees of the next 50 years. They're the investors of the next 50 years. And that's going to transform the world that we live in, I think, for the better. Thank you very much. Well, that was a very stimulating and rich discussion. I'd like to thank SOCAP and um, Ronnie Cohen for bringing us all together to talk about so many of these issues that he started the discussions about, you know, long ago and that have proven so important to our society today. Um, thanks to Jackie, to Meg, to Jacques Philippe, and, um, and to our audience that engaged with us this entire hour. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Kate. Great. Thanks so much. And I want to thank Leslie for a terrific job in facilitating the conversation. And thank each of you for, for gracing our platform. Seriously, it's this kind of conversation. The more we have it, the broader the message goes, the quicker that reality of making investing the same as impact investing. Entrepreneurs are all social entrepreneurs. Companies are all purpose-driven companies. The faster, the better. Um, with that, I will say farewell. We are having the third installment of this series where we're going to be actually talking to companies next week. And we've got um, Suzanne DiBianca, who's going to be joining us from uh, Salesforce, sharing a bit what she's working on. And then a young social entrepreneur, uh, 
twice over and she's only 16. So talk about op optimism and inspiration um, from the Laudato Tree Org. So we, we look forward to hopefully having you join us. And uh, we, again, know that you have a, a choice of how you spend your time. And thank you so much for spending it with us. Have a great rest of the week, all. Thank Take you. Take care. Thank, thank you, Jay. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.